movieweb.com. Well, I, I want to start this off by asking, you guys had planned to make the candy bar, or one of you, I don't remember, told me. Is this gone through? Did you find a manufacturer <laughs> to manufacture these for promotional so, items? Or? Like Lenny said, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, we, haven't, we haven't made the candy bar yet. Uh, just to sort of refresh people's minds, the candy bar is uh, a layer of nougat, chocolate, Salmon and then more nougat. What's it called? The slim and salmon. Slim and salmon. The, the, yeah. Title <laughs> after the, the, the yeah. The idea is, is a Japanese candy bar named after the uh, heavyweight boxing champ, who's who's the guy who owns the restaurant in our movie. The problem is, I bet you that already exists. It sounds Norwegian. Almost. Uh, oh yeah, I hear you. Well, the heavy you thing they were selling uh, at Trader Joe's for a while that was a bacon candy bar. Did you hear about this? No. And it was flying off the shelves, and they couldn't yeah. keep it around. It was. Like chocolate with bits of bacon, and it sounded horrible. Yeah, but it became this big sensation. So I, I think they make all that crap. Well, they might have to do like chocolate nougat, caramel, salmon, ginger, wasabi, chocolate. I see. Put a slice like, of cheese in there. Yes. Good, so, or good for the Wisconsin folks. Now, what is your guys' history with slam dance and taking your films to Sundance in Utah in general? Uh, our history is we, our first film. Um, was called Puddle Cruiser, and we took that to Sundance. Um, and uh, then the next film was uh, Super Troopers, and we also showed it at Sundance. And the next two or the next couple were next couple were done in the studios. Movies. And then this one we shot during the um, the Writers Guild strike because there was just no there were no movies being made. And so it went to Slam Dance instead of Sunday. Slam. So have you guys been there before? Uh, yeah, Slam Dance? Slam Dance many times, many times. Well, how's it evolved over the years? Because I know when they started it, uh, is it? It's not the one started by Troma, right? That's the other one. No, there were there were there was one year where I was there where there were so many. There was Slum Dance, uh, Slut Dance, uh, Scum Dance. Scum Dance. Uh, I think most of those have gone away. Although Slum Dance had a great little like party venue that was open till like eight. And they had all these pillows down there, and you go down there and smoke grass. So, did you ever go down there? Yeah. Slam dance? It was yeah. fun. Um, but uh, Slam dance is still, you know, they're still. Yeah, I don't think going. that's the troll one. But it evolved out of like people frustrated with Sundance. Yeah, there was a group of filmmakers who I assume didn't get into Sundance and they started <laughs> Slam dance, which was like, I think, part of a slam and part of a joke. And look, the reality is, it's. There are X number of slots, and there are many thousands of films, and everybody doesn't get in. Well, how do you feel that um, Slam and Salmon differs from the last couple of films that you guys have made? You just said it seems like a broader film? Uh, it's hard to say for me. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think it is a broad film, but I think it, it fits into the Broken Lizard movies that have been made before. I mean, up until now, I mentioned earlier, I, I directed the other movies. This time, Kevin directed it, and I think I think it feels very much like a Broken Lizard movie. I think there are like stylistic differences that he probably brought to it. I mean, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think rhythmically, like editing-wise, it kind of it feels like the rhythm that we our movies are in. It's just a small movie. I think that the, the contrast is just the last two films because there were studio movies just had a bigger scope, and this was one that we basically we had a very small script that we were kind of keeping around in case we thought, you know, let's just pop something off and the writer's strike happened, it was the perfect opportunity to uh, say, hey, we've got a couple months, we're not even working on anything else, uh, let's do this because it can be done cheap, it all takes place in essentially one location over the course of one night. So it just, uh, that's what I think is going to be the, the difference that you might notice between this and any of the previous films, it's just the kind of all in one spot. Yeah, we went to our Super Troopers investor and, and we got him to put up the money. Uh, so, hopefully it'll strike twice. <laughs> well, is the pressure sort of off of your shoulders since you didn't direct this time and it's Kevin's? I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't look at it that way. I mean, it's like, I think we're all sort of this team. Um, and so the pressure's probably on, on all of us. I noticed that he's like, being way more proactive uh, in terms of making sure the right people are at this screening, and he's he ends he's ended up doing a lot of things that I used to do. So, but part of what my feeling was about this movie was I'll let him direct it, and and then also 
make him do the shit that he's supposed to do. <laughs> not just yeah. sort of, you know. Not he was the guy pushing it from the beginning, too, also. He was the one who really was like, come on, let's do this, let's do this. So it was his, you know, he was very passionate about it. So we're yeah. going to let him run with it. Well, in the future, are you going to go back to directing, or Paul, yeah. are you going to yes. direct? Or? No, I am. You. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm wondering if you're going to break it up and let like, you guys yeah, all take it's like, a uh, a turn no, I think, like, look, uh, um, now that there are three guys in the group who have directed, I think a particular project, um, you know, but also because what we're doing is not just film projects, but we're trying to do some TV stuff, and like, a, we, I think we're going to do this uh, music video now uh, with the Eagles of Death Metal that I would direct, and so I think it's going to just be like, Depending on who's pushing a project through, I think that guy will then have the opportunity, or, or you know, there's just a lot of different sort of combinations that can happen now. Was well, the Eagles a death metal video something that all of you guys are tied into, or is that just something you're going to direct it's, on your own? It's, it'll be with the guys. It'll be the group and the band. And you know, I met the guys recently and hit it off. And I'm a big fan of of, of Josh and Jesse, and so. Uh, they have a new record out, which is great. And I said, you know what, I would love for somehow to combine us with them to do a video, because I always wanted to do music videos too. So um, it's something that I'm just kind of coordinating now. Uh, hopefully the next month we'll do that. Well, I haven't seen the movies coming together. Do you guys have like your own sp uh, favorite scenes that you think that your fans or people that aren't familiar with your work are really going to enjoy this time out? That you kind of hint about since we haven't uh... seen the trailer? My favorite scene is, uh, I mean, the, the champ has asked us to make, uh, you know, 10 grand, is it 10 grand? 10 grand. Yeah. 10, $10,000 for the night. No, no, the winner gets 10 grand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I already forgot how the movie goes. 20 grand? Yeah, 20 grand. Anyway, <laughs> asked us to make 20 grand for, for the night, and we're woefully behind in the middle of the um, contest. And so he screams at the entire staff to come to his office where he's gonna, basically he's gonna deliver the Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross a version of it, speech that Alec Baldwin did and where, where he just belittles everybody and yells at everybody about selling. And so that to me is my favorite scene in the movie. It's all of us just standing there being terrified. And we, none of us, almost none of us have any lines in the movie. <laughs> just as, in, in that scene, but he's, Michael Clark Duncan is just chewing us out, he's six, five and uh, you know, I think it turned out great. Terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of the review or yeah, reviews that you guys have gotten in the past have said one similar thing, and that's when we watch a Broken Lizard movie, they get better and better the more times you watch them and more things start to come out of them. And I'm wondering, and I sort of saw that on set too when I sat and watched one scene play like about five or six times. Yeah. And I'm just wondering what the process is for your writing or directing styles that you're able to make something that sort of just continues to build and build the more times you watch it. It's like, do you hide stuff in there for fans or? I think that the key is to write as many drafts as possible. And then, you know, and not, not really, I mean, look, we probably write like 20 drafts of a movie before we shoot it. And then, you know, we, we now, we isolate scenes that, you know, on paper are not really quite funny enough and we'll add a, some physical joke in the background or then we'll really focus on trying to Make sure the lines are, are, you know, that there's definitely funny stuff everywhere you go. And so we're trying to sort of layer it in there. If there's something in the background, there's something physical, there's something verbal. And, you know, I think, I think ultimately that's probably what people are talking about is that it's layered. Um, you know, we try not to do the super obvious, simple version of the joke. Try to give you a, a different take on it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, you know, sometimes I don't know that we're even thinking about it as much. It's just like, you got five guys all trying to throw stuff in there, and, and it just may be, it just, yeah, I guess like I said, you, we're just always trying to have something go on somewhere, and we, I guess if you're kind of maybe seeing it for the first time, you're trying to follow one thing and maybe missing it there through the things on the side. I don't, I don't know. I don't know exactly how I would say that that ends up happening, but we hear it all the time, so it must be happening. So I want to know how you guys dealt with the extras on set, because it seemed like it was the same extras for the whole movie, and they had to just sit there the entire time at their tables, like, having dinner? Oh, uh, well, yeah, I mean, you, you shoot those scenes with the big crowds all within, like, you know, a week. So they're really only there for a week, because you're trying to, like, from a budgetary standpoint, you're trying to minimize the number of days that you have them there. So, yes, they are the same people. They are sitting there, 
and we having were, dinner for a week. Well, the food was really good. We had a great chef who was cooking the food so they could actually eat it and and drink quietly as long as they didn't gulp too much. <laughs> Occasionally there'd be odd loud gulper. That you'd get that gulper and move them out of there. <laughs> uh, but it's you know, it's it, at least they were sitting down. I mean if you look at Beer Fest, we were in that in that Beer Fest room for we shot like three, two, and, three and a half weeks. Three weeks, weeks of there, and those were the same extras who were standing there. And they really were like those were the same people. <clears throat> and all the girls are in like six inch heels standing for like three weeks watching fake, us. Fake screaming going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. you know, so it those just, are the people we got. You know, that's, that's funny. Now what do you guys hope comes out of taking the film to Sunday or Slam Dance? Uh, well, we'd love, love to sell it and then, you know, get with a distributor and start to get ready to promote it to release it. That's the goal. Do you have like a plan for when you want to release it to the... No, you know, it's not really up to us. Somebody will buy it and it's, then it's their movie and we just try to help make as much money for them as possible. And what do you guys have coming up besides the Eagles of Death Metal? I mean, last time I talked to you guys, it seemed like you had like 12 different projects. Uh, we have been writing Super Troopers 2. Okay, so that's going to go through well, last we'll time. See. It sounded like you know, it was we're, we're, we're talking to, to them about it. I mean... I think we have to find the right, ultimately I think what, the best thing for us to do is just we're going to write the movie and then sit down and say, okay, here, here it is, here's what it's going to cost, here's what we can do it. And then we'll see, we'll see what happens. So we're, um, uh, we're trying to get a show, uh, a Broken Lizard television show to go to run on maybe cable on HBO or Showtime or somewhere like that, FX or somewhere. Uh, other writing and producing stuff, like we wrote in, are producing a TV pilot for Fox that hopefully we'll shoot, we'll find that soon. Um, we're producing a movie called Freeloaders with uh, uh, Adam Derritz brought us a script, so that starts shooting in a couple of weeks. And and he's the producing. singer he's, of Black Crows? He's yeah, kind of the Black Crows. Crows. Sorry. Uh, we had that joke in the movie. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so it's, that movie is... is uh, Adam has had a mansion in Beverly Hills that he was never there because he was always touring. And so, um, and he'd meet people on the road and say, oh, I have a house in LA, you can stay there. So there were these seven people living in this house that didn't really know each other. They eventually all became close friends. They were all friends with Adam in some way. And so they would throw these wild parties and they'd all claim to own the house to try to get, you know, to get girls or, or in one case, guys. Um, uh, and I went to that house probably eight times and never met Adam. And, uh, and so this story in the, in the movie is about basically Adam's house and he's going to get married and sell the house so all these folks have to sort of figure out what they're going to do. They're trying to sabotage it. So it's called Freeloaders. And can you tell me at all a little bit about the plot for Super Troopers 2? Just for the people uh, okay. Should, that. <laughs> should I? Yeah, well, okay. I mean, yeah. So, um, we... Uh, pick up essentially right where we left off uh, maybe maybe months later we are all working um, in a uh, uh, we're sort of undercover uh, for the lumber industry and what's happened is there are these eco terrorists who are you know trying to blow up lumber factories and so we're like now like security and there's this big sort of fun shootout did we, did we scrap that? Oh, we scrapped that. Well, we scrapped it, that. It, it, really what you're describing would be the first scene. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 the, the big picture thing is that basically, um, on the Canadian border, in reality, what's happened is that the government has found there are places where the, the markers were wrong or off, and there are places where the U.S. is saying, hey, this was always considered to be Canada, but it's actually U.S. The yeah, they the reassessed the border after after that one. Yeah, we were we we're enlisted because there's suddenly a stretch of what was always Canada uh, turns out to be the U.S. They got to send somebody there to help make it deal with it as a U.S. territory now, and so they don't have anybody else to send. The idea that we get recruited to basically go uh, to have to be now the highway patrol in a place that has always been Canada doesn't want to be the U.S. and all of a sudden we're thrown into like having to enforce U.S. law in a place full of Canadians who hate our guts. So it's, yeah. That sounds awesome. Yeah. 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 That's cool.